County Board of Commissioners, today is uh, a very fine day to do this. We're getting closer to the weekend, but uh, the long story short on this is we have a number of items on the agenda. Uh, and if uh, you haven't heard about what's going on, you're about to hear, and if you miss it, you want to leave us. This is for the June 3rd meeting. Right around the corner, we have a 21-item agenda, and I'll turn it over to our county manager, Dudley Watts, who's ready, willing, and able to do their job. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon again, everybody. Um, we do have um, the items to introduce for the June 3rd agenda. We do have two discussion items that I may just take first um, and go ahead and get those kind of out of the way. And then there's potentially a closed session um, only if there's some questions uh, about one of the items or, or an item that you hear that, that you might want um, to get uh, any advice from the attorney in closed session. Um, uh, but I think we can kind of let see where that goes uh, uh, as we as we get into the discussion. Um, the two two discussion items are the first one is really um, based on what you heard from Dr. Ole earlier around um, the mass guidance that was issued by the CDC, and then um, uh, and then the governor took action to for, with his governor's order, which essentially you know continues to mandate masks for unvaccinated people. Uh, but lifts the mandate for a mask um, for for vaccinated folks. So after a lot of work um, uh, with department managers, with the court system folks, uh, and with um, uh, the my other other managers in other towns uh, in the towns across uh, Forsyth County, um, and, and just just general work around the HR implications of, of some of this, we have issue. We are prepared to issue guidance. Um, if, if the, you, you have seen that, we actually got that out to you. If you feel like it's beneficial to go ahead and, and I could ask Chantel to run through it very quickly if you want to, or we can dispense with that. But nonetheless, uh, effective um, on Monday morning when employees come to work, they'll be under the new mass guidance, um, which takes us one more step into more normalcy across county operations, although it's, you know, it, it is a step. Would, would, you, would you want to get a quick run through? Sure, let's the, do the quick run through. Give us a little synopsis here. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, so the um, draft memo that we've prepared essentially outlines a few things. Um, so for employee mass guidance, we really wanted to make sure that there were some things in the CDC guidance and governor's guidance that were simply just required. Um, and that's for um, departments that provide public transportation, if anyone that work in schools, detention facilities, and public health settings. Um, and so that includes automatically the airport, Department of Public Health, as well as the detention center. Um, and then the ones that we've added really is a little bit of an extension of um, some of the guidance, and that is cooperative extension in the library's indoor youth programs. And the reason for that is that in schools, they are um, supposed to continue to wear masks because a lot of youth are not vaccinated or able to be vaccinated, as well as summer camps. And so Dr. Ohl felt very strongly that anything that involves our youth, we really need to ensure that we are protecting them. Um, and the other one that was added is emergency services department, specifically when they are providing patient care, because that is a type of health care setting. And so we want to ensure that we are protecting um, patients. And then the last one added was the Hall of Justice. And that really was because um, the elected officials in the Hall of Justice wanted to continue mask. Um, and so we want to honor their wishes. Um, and so um, essentially employees who are not vaccinated must wear face coverings when serving the public if they're not able to maintain six feet of social distancing from their colleagues and when visiting common areas um, such as restrooms, break rooms, elevators, and meeting rooms. Um, so not vaccinated must wear face coverings. Um, employees who are vaccinated would no longer be required to wear face coverings um, in our buildings except for those departments that I just outlined that would be required required whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. 
um, employees who visit non-county facilities would need to make sure you know they're following whatever the requirements of those facilities are. So we know some businesses may decide they want to continue with the re uh, mask requirements, um, and certainly our employees would need to comply with that. We would continue to make face coverings available to any employee who desires to wear a mask or is required to wear a mask. And so certainly there's nothing in the policy that precludes someone if they're vaccinated to not wear a mask. If you feel like you want to provide extra protection to yourself, by all means, you are welcome to do that. Um, and as you heard from Dr. Ohl earlier, he encourages everyone, whether they're vaccinated or not vaccinated, to continue to wear a mask. Um, for visitors, visitors who are vaccinated would no longer be required to wear a mask in our buildings, again, except for the departments that I outlined earlier. Um, and then visitors who are not that, I mean, visitors who are vaccinated would not be required to wear face coverings except in those departments. And if they're not vaccinated, they would be required to wear face coverings at all times. We would also continue to make masks available to any visitor um, who desires or would be required to wear a face covering. And then there is a caveat in the policy that in special circumstances, the county manager may implement stricter requirements. For example, for large crowded indoor events, and that is in line with CDC guidance and governor's orders as well, or when serving our vulnerable population. So for example, if you know a class of students wanted to visit the government center and see what government's all about, we would certainly um, want them to wear a mask and ensure our staff is wearing a mask as well. So we have a caveat for that. Um, we no longer require screenings in any of our buildings. That is under um, Dr. Ohl. Um, a lot of our buildings stopped doing that for a while. DSS and Public Health stopped doing that last week, but that is no longer a requirement. Um, we would continue to have signage in our buildings, so we want to ensure the public knows that if masks are required or not required in accordance with the departments or buildings they're visiting. And that really is it. Um, you know, we worked hard to really make sure that we were addressing the CDC and governor's guidance and just going a tad bit further to ensure that we were protecting um, our indoor youth um, in the patient care. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Chantel? Just one question, please, Chantel. Yes, sir. At our elaborate trustee board meeting last night, the question came up about masks, of course. <clears throat> and I uh, said we'd have some new information for them effective Monday. So we said, except for the children's area, that patients coming in would not be required to wear a mask. Is that essentially what we're saying? Um, so essentially what we're saying is that if there's any programs for youth, for the programs, they would be required to wear a mask. Okay. But otherwise, they would just follow the CDC and governor's guidance, which if they're vaccinated, they would not have to. Um, if they um, are not, they would be required to wear a mask. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chantel. Thank you. So the only thing I think I'd add is that um, this really does present an opportunity for us to really uh, make folks aware that vaccines are available. And so our, our focus is really going to shift now to, to that. And so um, and I, th I think that's that's appropriate. Oh, and the last caveat I will add, um, Dudley, is um, we do anticipate there may be some updates from possibly the Department of Labor or OSHA um, that may impact employees. So I just want you to know, you know, we will have to be flexible. If there are changes that are required by law, we will need to make them. But we are anticipating they'll issue some guidance um, in, as it relates to the American Disabilities Act and possibly some workplace um, business um, practices. Okay. All right, very good. The uh, second discussion item is, really relates back to uh, some actions the board took to declare property surplus and advertise them. There were two properties, and uh, Kirby Robinson has led the efforts to, to, to get those out to the public. So I'll turn it over to Kirby to talk about what, uh, what has transpired. Take it off, right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and board. I thought what I would do for this presentation, if it's acceptable to the board, is outline the offers that the county received on both the Highland property and the Clemens property, and then talk a little bit about the process the board can engage in uh, from here, if you so desire. So at your January 21st meeting, the board directed the manager to solicit fair market value offers for a 1.3 acre portion of the Highland Avenue property that's located south of the Annex 2 facility on the corner of 5th Street and Highland. It's about, again, 1.3 acres in size. 
Uh, the offer period uh, was 60 days long. It expired April 30th, and we marketed that property several ways. We put a physical sign on the property. Uh, we made sure the real estate community in town was aware that the board was open uh, to offers on it, and we highlighted it for sale on our website. The minimum offer uh, was set at $100,000. Uh, the board received two offers to purchase the property. Uh, the first we received, and when we asked for offers, we, we asked folks to give us four things. Who they are, what they were offering, what they proposed to do with the property, and then any additional details they wanted the board to know about their offer. Uh, and so I've sort of organized the summary by those four things. Uh, the first offer we received was from GW Holland Housing Corporation, and they proposed a purchase price of $100,000. And this is a quote from their offer. The proposed use of the land is to construct affordable housing for the senior and military veteran population. And then the additional details the, they wanted the board to know uh, is they are registered North Carolina nonprofit corporation. We also received an offer from United Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church in the amount of $125,000. Uh, their proposed use is a centralized park or urban green space, and that would come with a couple of things like pedestrian paths and playground equipment and, and so on. Um, the additional details that they had in their bid that I thought were noteworthy is while they are proposing to use it as a park, uh, they really have two development strategies by which to obtain that. Uh, one would be to purchase the property from the county, again, for the $125,000. And then they would sell the property to the city, and they said within about a year, uh, and the city would develop the property as the park. Uh, the plan B, if the city was unable or unwilling to complete that transaction, and they noted in their proposal that their council member had said this is something the city might be interested in, uh, plan B would be to develop uh, the site as an open-air food hub. And I assume that's sort of like a, a farmer's market or something like that. So that's the profile of the two offers the board received on the Highland property. And if you have any questions on those, I can certainly address them now, or I can cruise right on into the Clemens property. Questions or comments? What, what is the kind of the next step? Is, it, is this going to an upset bid process? That's a great question. Let me, let me skip two slides ahead, and we'll, I'll talk a little right. bit about that. Oh, three slides ahead. So at this point, the board has complete discretion over what to do now. Uh, if you desire still to sell either property, you can select one of those offers and advertise it for upset bids. That would be the process to engage in to sell the property. You can, if you do uh, desire to do that, we'll bring in official resolution, of course, to, to do that. During the upset process, you can reject offers at any time. Uh, you can place general restrictions on the use of the property and require any subsequent bidder to meet in substantially the same form those use requirements. Um, by law, we would collect the 5% deposit from the, uh, from the bidder. That deposit would be applied to the purchase price of the property less the cost of the advertisement. And then at the completion of the upset bid process, you would have the opportunity to approve that sale prior to the county engaging in a, a purchase and sale contract. So you would vote on it twice, once to advertise for upset bid, and then once to consider the last and highest offer. Um, does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Great. Additional questions? One question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. How long will the upset bid process last? 30 days or? It's a great question. So the, the upset process is 10 days. If you receive an upset bid within that 10-day period, it starts over again. Um, and so uh, the, the clerk uh, is statutorily uh, the, the entity that handles that process. And there's minimum thresholds that a bidder would have to meet. And the county attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's, it's a 5% upset, quarter? 5% upset. So. Or, or at a minimum $750, I think is the way the statute reads. Okay. Additional questions, comments? So in terms of what do we need to do to, to, it, on those first two? Yes, sir. I mean, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're pretty different. They are. Uh, so one clearly, you, you kind of, once it's done, you know what it is. The second one, I mean, I like it, and I like the, that development plan, but it also sounds like yeah, it might be a park for a while, and then it might turn into some mm -hmm. other stuff. And I guess that's probably that's probably the only thing that gives me a little heartburn. Sure. And, and uh, the, the manager can help me sort of think through this a little bit. In my mind, you're, you're sort of making the determination that, number one, we want to sell the property, right? So that's sort of the first step. And the second part is, you know, what's sort of your goal in that? Is it to obtain, you know, the highest dollar amount? Is it to potentially control the use of the property? So that I think there's a determination on the use of the property there. And then once you sort of settle on those things, you would then pick an offer that meets kind of that criteria and direct uh, the manager to advertise it for upset bid. 
and then you could condition that on the potential use of the property if that was a concern. I think the more that you condition the use, uh, the, the you know, less you know, potential revenue you might receive on the property is probably a good thought, too. That might not be your primary concern in it, obviously. Additional comments? If you're this limited one? to use it all, does it give an opportunity for either bidder to withdraw? So you would, uh, and I might misunderstand your question. So if you, if you pick, let's say, the Holland Housing Corporation, because they submitted their offer first, I'm just talking about them in this context, and you said, uh, we're going to condition the use such that it's senior uh, and a, a military veteran affordable housing. We might go and work with our economic development housing folks to develop some metrics for that potentially and advertise that as the, however the board would want us to. Uh, and then sort of the other bidder in this, in this case is, is not in that picture. They could then come and upset that bid if they meet uh, that use requirement. Yeah, I, I'm more issue, because if, if, you, if you built affordable housing, it's not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> the, the, first, the second bidder is not sure where it's going. And that's, I mean, that's the only issue. I mean, if it was, if it was if the, let's just say the condition was the proposal now is a park. And if the condition was it remains a park, does that give the second, the, 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 the $125,000, the, the church, an opportunity to say, well, if I don't have an opportunity, if, if that's the only thing it can be, I withdraw. That's what I'm trying to get at. I, I would assume that they, you could, you could set that in a resolution, and they could, they, they could withdraw by not placing a deposit and proceeding with the offer. Okay, that, that makes sense. At this point, there's that, that no financial sense. consideration. That, that makes sense. It's, no, no, it's like no cards played yet. That's right. Got, it's just an offer. We've just, we've just looked at what the game is. Right? Yes, sir. I, I got you. Kerb, I had one other question, please. Yes, sir. Finish down. When they explained the concept of going to the city to develop this park, did they get affirmation that the city would participate in that? So the, the comment in the bid was that the council member for that ward has communicated the city has funds, is actively seeking to spend sort of park funds on land acquisition was how I read the bid. There was no commitment on the part of the city, and I think that's why there's a plan B in there. So I think that's sort of up in the air as, as I read the bid. Was just on a 30 second response to that. I'm trying to maintain my religious stature here. <laughs> You're trying to deal with the city and it may become a food court as another option to use that property. An, an open air food hub, which I interpret to be sort of like farmer's market. Yes. Well, I don't think that meets our standard. I'll just stop right there. Well, I have to say that I think we need to remember who owns the land. And uh, we put it out for bid and gave direction. And to me, it should go to the highest bidder. That's what we would typically do. Um, I don't know why we should treat this any differently than what we usually do. Um, and if it's going to be a park, I think it's a wonderful idea to be a park. If it isn't, and you say it possibly could be food, I just heard, I mean, just the uh, sheriff this morning in the paper said one of the problems is that kids are hungry. They don't have enough fresh vegetables. Well, there's your answer. Um, I, I don't have a problem with this at all. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I don't either. And, we, and I just kind of, I, I, I guess I, I guess probably what I, and you, I, I guess if I'm, in, I'm envisioning, you know, the things that are sold at the fair, you pull up a trailer for the weekend and you, and you serve some sort of, you serve barbecue and this guy's got sausages and this guy's got thing and two or three things and you have a whole lot of sort of congregation, trash, mess, and that kind of stuff, which would be somebody else, which if the city didn't do it, it'd be the church's responsibility to deal with that. I'm just trying to get at that part. But a, 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 a farmer's market in the sense of fresh vegetables, foods, and those kind of things, I'd be great. I'm, I'm, I'd be great with that. I think that's. I think that's a, a great use. I mean, is that not what they said? I, I would probably need to clarify exactly what an open air food hub is, mm -hmm. uh, and I can bring that back to you. And I think the way to do that, and the county attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, we can handle that through a, a contract and a deed restriction, essentially. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I would, and then just go through the upset bid process. Mm -hmm. People want to. That's great. I would just say I would just caution um, the board and, and staff that we if we make the restrictions too tight, then we're defeating the upset bid process. So I, I would 
you probably want it to be broad enough to include uses that you think would be acceptable, but you certainly don't want to limit it to the original bidder. Chair, Chair, chairman, if I may. Um, Go right ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to weigh in on this because um, I had a little bit of heartburn when we first start discussing um, the use of this property and making it available for sale. Um, we wanted to, do, to stay in alignment with what was already happening um, with public health and DSS. So I believe that we, I remembered in that, um, in that process, we did discuss affordable housing. And it's hard for me to accept even a higher offer that do, it does not align with the mission of the intended use. Um, so I just wanted to make that statement. Well, we also said we wanted it to try to stay a public health campus. And to me, a park is certainly part of a healthy life. And um, a farmer's market, I understand, is desperately needed. And fresh food is certainly part of public health. Yeah, my last I mean, comment for now. I guess, I guess what I would have liked to have, Chairman or um, Dudley, is that if there was some intent in terms of United Missionary Baptist Church, which does wonderful things in this community, they are a great church. Um, I wish they just should have come and kind of had some conversations with us. That would have been helpful for me. Well, I was going to ask, maybe it's an attorney question, is there a problem uh, with the board hearing presentations from both uh, both bidders? The, you could absolutely do that. As, as Kirby stated when he started off, y you have the discretion here. You don't have to sell the property or you can sell it to whoever you want if we go through this upset bid process. So certainly if you wanted to hear um, from each of these um, bidders, you could you could do that. Fleming Alameen. Mm -hmm. I lost my thought for a minute, but I think it's coming back. Um, Kirby, just in terms of process, if we offer plan B an option to buy this property and plan A comes along and says, listen, I'm going to offer an upset bid, how does that work? So it, it, it's, it, it has not happened a lot, actually, with some of the ones I've worked with in the past. Um, but they would essentially bring in their deposit for 5% of their offer amount, and that's how they would upset the bid. They would deliver that to the clerk. Uh, and that 10-day period, everybody would be notified, and the 10-day period would restart. And that goes on until you reach the last and highest bidder. So, Chairman, if I may, um, and if I'm out of order, Gordon, please assist me with this. But um, I probably would like the board to just kind of step back for a moment and realign our mission and goal for this property because, again, we've been we've – been notified that we have an opportunity to, um, to not sell it at all. Um, and that may be the course that we want to take until we've readily identified what the purpose of or the intended use for this property is going, going to be. So whatever the steps need to process that, if we could, you know. Mr. Manager. Uh, the only thought I had, which aligns with what Commissioner McDaniel is saying, is um, some of those uses, as I understand it, actually require rezoning. Is that true, Kirby? I, I think um, that both of these uses could could happen to some degree under the, okay. the zoning. The park, the park might be the only one, but typically parks are pretty easy to work into them. Yeah. Okay. Surprisingly, the multifamily part actually works into Does it. Okay. So. Yeah, so we are at your disposal. I think there's a lot of ideas. Perhaps we put this on the shelf for a minute or two, and um, when everybody gets ready to just let me know when we're ready to Take sort of the next step. Good idea. Or, 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 or do we just, do we want to hear, I mean, we didn't hear from the church. And I mean, I, I, I thought the presentation about the, about the, the housing deal was clear. And I, I got it. I visited their other place. And I understand what they do. I understand why they want it. And I understand why it's, I, I, it's, it fits. On the other hand, also, that's, I agree with uh, Commissioner McDaniel, great church. I kind of like to hear their sort of vision of that a little bit more and a little bit more about kind of the some of the what ifs might be on that because I think that is our job is to decide that purpose and what it could become or might become. And I'd probably be interested in hearing what they got to say, but I don't want, if no one, if I'm the only one, 
I don't just not do it. Now, I'd very uh -huh. much like to hear what they say. We have certainly heard from uh, uh, the first purchase, uh, Holland House. We've heard from them on numerous times. I can recite what theirs are. Um, so I very much would like to hear um, uh, from the second bidder. Maybe we can set that up for yeah. the next meeting because over almost half of us want to go ahead and do that. Let, let, Matt, yes, go right ahead, sir. I don't know how much of this we can say, but we, we've had presentations about that area of the city. We had one just a week ago, and it seems to me that some coordination is probably needed here, and maybe all of these entities could get together somewhere and, and have a discussion about what that should look like. It is, without a doubt, going to be a very important part of Winston-Salem mm -hmm. uh, in, in the near future, a very near future. And economic opportunities there are huge. So I, I hope that we can get these groups together, the ones that pre presented us last week mm -hmm. and, and the two churches, because I, I just hate to waste this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to see a presentation too, especially involving a city. Anyway, I'd like to see a presentation from United Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church in full of details and explain to me what they plan to do with the property. Okay, so from a scheduling perspective, since we're getting ready to enter the budget process, I might suggest that we do try to do it you know, once we complete that in mid-June. And so maybe I, I think I saw enough interest in that to mm -hmm. go ahead and invite um, them in. Uh, for a presentation in that mid-June time frame. That works, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Kirby, thank you. Um, we do have one other property. Let me let sure. you keep on track. Thank you. Mm. All right. Uh, at your March 4th meeting, again, you directed uh, the manager to do a similar thing, to seek fair market value offers on the old Clemens Branch Library. And that's, of course, located at 3554 Clemens Road. Uh, that offer period was open for 60 days. It expired May 14th. Uh, we marketed the properties uh, in the exact same way as the Highland property, and the minimum offer amount was set at $787,000, which is the current tax value of the property. Uh, you received one offer on that property. It was a purchase price of $800,000, and it came with the stipulation the seller would pay a 4% brokerage commission. Uh, so your net cash offer is $768,000. The intended use, as contemplated in the offer, is traditional office space. Uh, and that would be used as the headquarters of breakfast time. Uh, a couple of additional details, that property would require a rezoning. It's not a huge rezoning, but it would be one to change to office use. Uh, the buyer has proposed to handle that rezoning process with the board support. That would take an additional action of the board to rezone that property. Uh, if advertised for upset bid, again, we would advertise the net cash offer, which is $768,000 as the upset bid amount. Um, I will note there appears to be additional interest in the community in that property that could materialize in an upset bid process just based on the number of calls I've received on it. Yeah. The, Kirby, the only thing I heard, um, it, it, would, it would be the village of Clemens board that would do the rezoning, mm -hmm. right? The board would vote uh, to authorize the rezoning as the property owner, I think is what I was speaking. Gotcha, about. okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, and we went through the process uh, a little bit. Again, it's your complete discretion. We can bring you back an upset uh, bid resolution for that property. Uh, and just a quick summary, you see the table there of the offers. Again, you have control of the, the process and can direct staff uh, in any way you see fit. Uh, again, I'm happy to answer any questions the board has. Questions or comments? So when do we vacate that building? It's coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'll defer to Damon. So uh, they start uh, packing the move on May 24th, and the building will uh, close to the public on June 1st, and then uh, we will uh, open the new library on June 10th. With grand opening ceremonies? On June 17th. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kirby. Thanks, sir. Any direction on, uh, on on this property uh, at this meeting? Go, is there interest in going ahead and? Uh, yep. Okay. So so I, would you you would like to see um, we we can actually include it in this next agenda. So um, let's do that. All right. Very good. All right. So with that, I'll go ahead and dive into the. That's, that's a good segue into the items for consideration at the June third meeting. I'll go ahead and dive into it. Um, the um, you've got the old business. 
let me take that off. Uh, you got the old business that's items one, two, three, and four. Um, so I don't think we need to go back through um, any of those in any more detail because we just uh, just did. Uh, item five is a resolution recognizing June 15th as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in Forsyth County, North Carolina, and Rick Hall will be here to, to talk to that. Uh, item six is a resolution supporting the eligibility for and nomination of the Elizabeth and Bowman Gray Jr. House for the National Historic Register of Historic Places. Aaron King should be on the line and review this matter. Aaron, you there? I am, Dudley. Can everybody hear me okay? And yes, sir. Slides all right? Sound good. All right. Well, um, if this property looks familiar to you, it should. We talked about this in December of last year. Um, this is the Elizabeth and Bowman Gray Jr. house. You can see a picture of the house there on the slide in front of you. And you can see a location map. This is in the uh, just west of the Brookberry Farm uh, neighborhood. You can see the property outlined uh, in, in yellow and orange there. This is an image looking at the just an aerial image looking at the um, the existing house and the outbuilding and the, the accessory buildings that are part of this National Register uh, nomination. So just kind of in review, as we think about National Register uh, listings, there's there's two buckets there: significance and it being an important example of period architecture, landscape, or engineering, and also integrity that the property we're discussing must retain enough of its uh, historic character to represent the period. And associations adequately, and this site does both. So, um, April seventh, the State Historic Preservation Office uh, the requested comment from from your um, from the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners uh, on May the fifth. The Historic Resource Commission unanimously recommends the Gray House be determined eligible for listing. Uh, and then, as we're briefing this today, we're getting this ready for a June third. Um, vote on the eligibility from the commissioners, and then from there, this would go to um, to the state for uh, a vote on eligibility. So, so just to remind the commissioners, what we did in December that was a local historic landmark request, and the board did approve that. That carries with it some some regulatory requirements in terms of the um, any alterations to the property that those meet our, our local historic landmark um, standards. What we're doing today with a National Register nomination, that is really more of a tool. It's not so much a regulatory tool, but it is more a tool to recognize the, the significance of the property. So just wanted to make that distinction, and I'm glad to answer any questions if there are any. Comments or questions? One question, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Aaron, I think at our last presentation, I mentioned that you know I've been at this property a few times for fundraising activities, and there are two graves of enslaved people in that property that go back a few decades. And I want to make sure that those will not be disturbed in this designation. Yep, Commissioner Elamy, you absolutely did ask about that. And um, those grave sites are not located on the subject property. They are, they're not located there. And it's my understanding that the, the developer of Brookberry Farms is well aware of those grave sites. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay. I think that's it. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Um, agenda item seven is approval of the minutes for the meeting of May 6th and May 20th. They will be forthcoming via email to you. Uh, item eight is a public session. Item nine is an amendment to the 2020-2021 debt service fund to appropriate $6,750,000 of 2021A limited obligation bond proceeds for the redemption of callable maturities from the 2009 limited obligation bonds. Sounds very complicated. Lee Plunkett. Uh, our system CFO is going to do uh, this. Uh, Lee, are you there? Lee, are you there? I'm here. I believe you got your um. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Cut your computer off or whatever the. Get a little echo. Sorry. Oh um. Let's see. You got a little that. feedback. He probably cut his computer off. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Are you there? Can you? Am I, am I coming up now? We cannot hear you very well at all, Lee. Is it June when folks can start coming back in here? Right. <laughs> Thank you. He usually does pretty well. Lee. 
Lee, I am going to move to the next item. I'll come back to you. Uh, agenda item 10 is an amendment to the FY 2021 budget. <laughs> <It'll>... <laughs> Appropriates $40,000 of committed fund balance to the library for the purchase of technology. Brian Hart should be on the line. Brian, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. Very good. Go ahead and review it. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon commissioners and, and county manager. Um, yes, this particular uh, budget transfer would allow for the library to purchase um, numerous uh, different uh, technology to support uh, programming for uh, ages, for all ages, uh, frankly, out of the central library. Uh, we're excited to be able to do this. This was my understanding is that this was a part of uh, the original um, allocation for the department uh, or for the central library location when it was uh, kind of first erected and established here. And so uh, we're excited to be able to do this and bring this to the community at this time. Yeah, just as a reminder to the board, there were some donated funds that were received and and so this honors the the intent of those donated funds so um that's that's kind of where we are with this one any questions for brian questions comments okay all right agenda item 11 is amendment to the fy 2021 budget ordinance to appropriate operation fan heat relief program funding allocation for the forsyth county department of social services to continue the administration of that program sherry cook should be on the line sherry are you there i'm here can you hear me we can Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Forsyth County has received $3,275 to continue administration of the Operation Fan Heat Relief Program. The purpose of these funds is to purchase fans to be distributed to the older adults and, older, and adults with disabilities to make a more comfortable living environment and reduce heat-related illnesses during the summer. The program service period is from May to October of 2021. The eligibility and the distribution of the fans will be determined by the DSS Adult Services Social Workers. Um, the funding is provided by contributions from Dominion Resources, Duke Energy Carolinas, and Duke Energy Process. Progress. There are there is no county money involved in with this program. Any questions? Co comments or questions? How many fans can you buy for thirty two hundred dollars? Um, we're hoping to buy about one hundred and eighty. Okay. Okay. There you Thank go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sherry. I'll, I'll go back to item nine. Lee, are you on the line? Lee is not on the line. I can tell you what this item is. Um, so when you issue when we issued this recent debt that we did so well with, there was actually some bond premium that, that occurred. And you know, we made a decision a number of years ago not to try to expand the scope of projects with bond premium, but rather to to make sure that it kept the the uh, the, the intent of the original issuance whole. And so what this does is appropriate that and essentially to pay debt service with. So that that's what that bond that one does. I'll um, I'll check in with Lee and make sure. Perhaps we'll get Lee in, in chambers next uh, Thursday to, to make sure there's no questions. Anything else on that? Okay. Item 12 is a resolution authorizing and funding positions to be utilized for paid intern partnership for a paid internship partner with Greater Winston, Inc. Shannon Hutchins, our HR director, is here. Mark Owens. There's Lee. Look at that. Uh, <laughs> and Mark Owens may be on the line. I don't know. He is. Okay. Hi. Good, a good afternoon, commissioners. Um, so this resolution is um, a resolution authorizing and funding for um, paid internship um, positions for four of them um, in relation to the Aspire Winston-Salem internship program. So this is an exciting program that provides opportunities to students in Title I high schools with the goal of interrupting intergenerational poverty. So Mark Owens is on the, um, the line. Um, and he's here to provide a presentation to you all. Um, and so I'll hand it over to him now. Mark, are you there? Thank you, Shannon. I'm here. Can you hear me, Dudley? I can. Thank you, Commissioners, Chairman Plyler, Vice Chairman Martin, and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's been a pleasure for our team to work with Shannon and her team. Um, I believe I have the opportunity to share my screen with you real quick. 
if uh, you can see the Aspire logo there looks, on the screen. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. So, commissioners, we have uh, embarked on an um, opportunity to have paid internships as a partnership with one sound for South County Schools. As you might think, it is a challenge when it's working with uh, minors under 18, and so there are a lot of steps that our HR professionals like Shannon and our team have to take in order to make this program work and get going, but we're excited to launch a pilot program for this summer. And in this summer, we're specifically focused on a smaller number of students in order to, to test it and make sure it's going forward properly and then be able to launch into our, a broader program as we go into the fall. Our school board has been incredibly supportive with our contract uh, with the winston Salem for South County School Board to help participate in a career readiness opportunities. So what is Aspire? I'll just hit a couple quick um, PowerPoint slides for you. Uh, this is a little bit about the timeline. We have a memorandum of agreement that uh, Dion and the, the attorney at Winston Salem for South County Schools has helped create. And we're asking that for South County, as Shannon mentioned, be considered to be one of those hosts to hire four students, um, as she mentioned, for our summer program, our pilot program. Today, actually, we are doing a workshop um, that I'll explain in just a minute with students at Forsyth Tech to help get our high school students ready. But host companies will participate in virtual interview sessions uh, that are scheduled for June 2nd. With the goal of having the uh, matching happen by June 11th and the internship be approximately June 15th through August 15th. Uh, in that, the duration, it's an ongoing agreement, so once you sign it once, it, it is, it, you don't have to sign it every semester or every season, if, if that makes sense. The internship period, that it will become a year-round program, but we're talking about today mostly just the summer part of that process. In selection, the, the companies agree to participate in one of those interview events per period to help make sure they're engaged, and then we'll go into our schools to help with career readiness opportunities as well. So just hitting a couple of these, um, the 80 hours is our goal during that period to help the student have a meaningful time and a meaningful experience with that paid internship. And it would be scheduling, the host company would be in charge of developing that work schedule for the intern. So how, what is the cost and what does this look like? Um, a couple of other things quick first. We're looking at industry sectors for the summer. We're specifically working with the city and the county and other nonprofits like Novant Health to try to make in, in city government to try to get that started as one of our key industry sectors. Um, but really, we want to have fun and get students to, to dream and see what opportunities are there. What I am excited to tell you today is that we will cover 100% of the pay uh, for the students in the summer period for June 15th to August 15th. So if you hire, Forsyth County hires those interns, 100% of their wages will be reimbursed. And this shows a little bit of how that reimbursement will take place. We've been able to do this due to some great grants by Truist and Bank of America. I mentioned Forsyth Tech, they're involved. We had an employability workshop today where we are helping uh, teach our young people how to become employed. We'll coach on resume writing mock interviews, and again, the virtual mini interview sessions to get practice as they go. And then we will launch into a long-term program as we go into our Title I schools with our summer pilot and then get into the full program in the fall. The one change that happens in the fall is instead of 100% reimbursement, we go to a 50% match reimbursement. So for $10 an hour, we would pay $5 an hour and ask the host company to consider paying that other $5 an hour. But right now we're focused on the summertime and we'd be honored if, if Forsyth County would help lead and launch our Aspire Winston-Salem Forsyth County program. I'm gonna try to stop my screen share and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And Shannon, hopefully I hit the highlights for you. Questions, comments? It's a great idea, I really appreciate it. Sure is. Thank you, Mark. All right, very good. So I am going to go back to Agenda 9 because I told you, everything I told you was totally wrong. I was thinking it was something, it was a different item, so I'll turn it over to Lee Plunkett who who either drove downtown very fast or ran upstairs. I think it was the latter, so. Uh, my apologies for that, commissioners. Um, so as a part of our upcoming limited obligation bond sale, 
Uh, this month, or excuse me, this next month, uh, we're going to refund our 2009 limited obligation bonds. And so as part of that sale, we're going to get proceeds from the sale, and then we're going to uh, receive that, and then we're going to pay off our bondholders. And so it'll be an amendment to the debt service fund for $6.75 million in order to do that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments? Glad you made it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. All right. Agenda item 13 is a resolution awarding a, awarding a contract for a computerized maintenance management system. Kirby Robinson with General Services will review. Good afternoon again, Commissioners. Getting good at this. All right. All right, as quick background on this item, uh, General Services has used a computerized maintenance management system, or a CMMS, since 2002. In May of 2012, General Services and the Parks Department transitioned to a system called Maintenance Edge, uh, and that's provided by a company called Dude Solutions. And since that time, both departments and now the airport uh, has used this system to manage work orders, track inventory, plan preventative maintenance tasks, forecast future capital expenditures, and monitor utility usage. Just so you know, kind of the scope that we're working with in the system, uh, which is shared among the three departments, we track information on 3 million square feet of actively maintained space, uh, 6,000 building assets, 3,500 inventory items, 3,000 PM schedules. We have 180,000 uh, historical work orders in the system. 140 building locations, 650 fleet vehicles, and 40 facilities. It almost starts to sound like a Christmas song after a minute. <laughs> um, with respect to purchasing, our current contract for the system expires June 30 of this year, uh, and the current system is no longer being developed by the provider. So in response, we developed an RFP and bid a five-year contract for this type of system through purchasing. And you see our bid criteria as weighted below. Uh, we received five responses, and a panel of county employees interviewed four companies. One of the five bids was not responsive due to the way they submitted their pricing. Uh, and the panel ranked Dude Solutions as the highest scored provider. The total five-year negotiated cost of the new system, which is called Asset Essentials, is proposed to the board at $352,956. It includes a couple of upgrades over our current system. Number one, it lets us be mobile. Uh, so our technicians can take mobile devices and tag the system in the field. It includes a fleet module, which we do not have now. It lets us barcode equipment, which is really neat because a technician can walk up with an iPad and scan an air handler and it'll go straight to it in our system. A GIS integration, which lets us see our assets across the county on a map. It's a central document repository for warranties and manuals and it has detailed analysis tools. A couple of KPIs that the current system has let us produce that we're proud of, I just wanted to briefly share with you. Over the past year, General Services has completed almost 22,000 work orders. 44% of those were planned maintenance work orders, meaning we were intentionally doing it. It was not a corrective order. Uh, and we're proud of that because it shows a proactive approach to maintaining equipment. We're trying to get to it and maintain it before something bad happens to it. And we've tagged 36,000 hours of labor to PMs. Each technician completes about 60 work orders each month, and we complete most corrective work orders uh, within a week, 90% of the time. So in summary, based on the responses we received to our bid, uh, the General Services Department in conjunction with Parks and the Airport recommends awarding a five-year contract to Dude Solutions. Uh, the not to exceed amount is $352,956 and some change. Uh, the new system will provide modules for work order management, preventative maintenance, fleet management, parts inventory, energy management, and capital forecasting. And I'm happy to answer any questions the board has. Questions or comments? Uh, I, and, I, and I may have missed how you said it, but the, the company Thing Tech, was that, the, the one was not, were they the ones that you considered? No, sir. Uh, Thing Tech uh, was the number, if I recall correctly, was the number two ranked bidder. Accruent uh, was the non-responsive. Uh, well, Thing Tech, according to here, the Thing Tech had a two hundred three thousand dollar bid. That's right. And, and Dude Solutions at three sixty five. So, what was wrong with the Thing Tech proposal? So you saw our, our weighted bid criteria there. Price is forty percent, and they, uh, of course, got I think the total amount of points for price. Um, you know, honestly, it was, a, it was a good system. It did meet our module criteria, meaning they were able to fulfill those modules. There were some upgrades in that, that 
or just not in that system. We really looked at their system as a really up and coming thing that is probably our current system five or six years ago. Um, the, way that, that it's, the way that it's laid out, the functionality of it, uh, it does not perform at the higher level we were essentially looking for in that, uh, in a new system. Do we, do we they are, they're primarily a fleet management company. Um, and they were then developing some of these other modules um, to meet um, not just our criteria, they're expanding into that business. We didn't feel like the product was quite where it needed to be uh, for our size. I've said this before. I mean, I like Dude Solutions. They have a school version. It's been great. It was great. And this, and this is a good one. But in our RFP, we made it clear that we were expecting some of those upgrades. I'm just kind of curious about a bidder that we didn't know we had to have the, the upgrades. So, software is a, yes, sir, we did. Um, software is a tricky thing to, to bid, right? So some, some folks have an off-the-shelf solution that has to be customized a little bit. Some folks have not a whole lot that has to be customized a lot. Uh, so that's hard to put into an RFP when the, the market varies so much. Um, so we did go through a, a great amount of detail to lay out the specifications we were looking for. We really modeled that not after Facility Dude, but the things we liked in Facility Dude, knowing that we wanted to expand into a fleet module, into barcoding, and all that stuff. And so they meet that basic criteria. They do. Um, it is not the functionality and that type of thing, I think we didn't feel like was advanced uh, to the point that we wanted it to be. It reminded us a lot, again, of Facility Dude five or six years ago. I got it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Additional comments? Okay. All right. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks, sir. All right. You got two items that Chelsea Swain with General Services is going to review. Item 14 is a resolution awarding and ex authorizing execution of a contract for the purchase of printing consumables toner for Forsyth County General Services. And you also have the one for paper and envelope supplies. As you know, we go through a lot of that just as a, as a county organization. So, Chelsea, are you on the line? Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Can you review both of these since I've introduced them both and just make sure you speak loudly? Yes, sir. Mm. Good afternoon, commissioners. The first item here is to award and authorize the execution of a contract to purchase printing consumable, which is toner cartridges, for the print shop to fulfill orders that they receive from all county departments. This bid was released via the count city county purchasing department on March 31st. And the bid was for all of the supplies to be purchased from the same vendor, so one single vendor. We received eight responses on April 23rd. The recommendation is to award to RACIC Computer Center Incorporated doing business as academic supplier. It would be for a one-year period of July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2022. It's at a total not to exceed amount of 115000 $455.03. This is less than our current fiscal year. However, we, we buy less. We're not using as much toner because we're doing away with the desktop units um, and going more towards the multifunctional devices that MIS manages. Um, Ray 6 Computer Center Incorporated, doing business as academic supplier, is a vendor we've used in the past before we switched to purchasing from one single vendor. We we had no problems with them in the past. They are um, headquartered out of Chula Vista, California. Um, however, I did uh, check with their references, and all three of their references uh, recommended them very much so. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Comments or questions? A lot okay. of competition for that. Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you. I'll move, into, I'll move into the next item. The next one is to award and authorize the execution of a contract to purchase paper and envelope supplies, also for the print shop to fulfill orders um, from all of our different county departments. This bid was also released from the City County Purchasing Department on March 31st. Um, and again, we did it for the bid to go um, one single vendor to per, um, supply all of the items. We only received three responses with this on April 21st, and one was considered non-responsive because they could not supply um, quite a bit of the supplies that we need. The recommendation is to award to B.W. Wilson Paper Company Incorporated for a one-year period, July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2022. It's a negotiated total not to exceed amount of $125,800. $14.17. The, 
This is an increase over the current year. Um, our usage has stayed about the same except for some items related to COVID. However, the pricing of products has increased dramatically since last year. Um, and B.W. Wilson is our current vendor. This, if awarded, they, this will be their third year of uh, being the vendor for paper and envelope supplies purchases, and we're very satisfied with them, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on this. Questions or comments? How, how much was the increase uh, this year over last year? The negotiated total, so for what we are going to award, was a 2.4 increase. If we went with their initial response before we took out some options of supplies to offer, it would have been a 12%. Good. Yeah, is that, you went from 137 to 125, so the 125 was, would you say, four, three, what was the percentage? 3.4. 2.4. 2. 4. 2. 4. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, item 16 is a resolution awarding a contract to Law Enforcement Services Group, PLLC, for pre- and post-hire psychological and medical services. Randy Hunsucker, the sheriff's business officer, should be on the line. Randy, you there? Uh, yes, sir, Dudley, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Dudley, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, many of you may know uh, Major Henry Gray uh, to my right, and he's going to start us off today. Good afternoon. The items for you is to prove uh, continuation contract with the FMRT, known as the uh, Law Enforcement Service Group. It also provides psychological services uh, for post-hire medical services otherwise fit for duty. In the past, the staff has communicated with LabCorp, the Public Health Department, Wake Forest Baptist Health and Occupational Health Services, and LESI out of Greensboro. However, none of the vendors have the capacity to conduct this work or too far and inconvenient for the employees to fund this. And uh, the funds for this contract will be included uh, in the proposed 21-22 budget, and we're uh, asking for no additional funds. Are there any questions we can answer for you today? Comments or questions? Did, Randy, did you not get any other sort of vendors that could bid on this service? Uh, it, uh, the, the FMRT group has a trademarked uh, brains assessment that no one else has. Um, we know we have communicated a lot with the Public Health Department, uh, Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. I mean, and this, no one has the capacity to, to provide us what we need at the volume we need it. So this is the only company that we can find right now. We've tried. I, I can't imagine that. I, and I'll tell you why, because, I mean, there, I mean psychological services and pre-screening, pre-hire work, I mean, that's done in every big police office and sheriff's department in this country, and I can't imagine that all of them are going to Greensboro to FMRT. Well, it's the only uh, company locally. I mean, the closest one is in Greensboro, which, as the major said, is too far away for our employees to go. Uh, so it's the only local, it's the closest company that does this. And, and, and it's a one-stop shop. So you don't have to have a contract with LabCorp, a contract with FMRT, a contract with somebody else. It's all one-stop shop. Uh, and no other vendor here locally has brains assessments, which we use uh, to uh, do the initial screening for our candidates. It's a trademarked set. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm not familiar with a trademark issue for psychological services and review, but I, I'll trust you on that. And I do think 90000 is a pretty reasonable fee. It just strikes me that that would, it strikes me you could also do, I mean, in the in the virtual world, do basically virtual assessments, um, and you could be anywhere in the country. I, I, and and is, is there something unacceptable about uh, kind of the, the virtual pre-hire psych psychological interview? Well, some of it's like a, a random drug testing uh, and the pre-hire drug testing, which is uh, you have to do that in person. I know, and, and as you said, LabCorp is right here, and they do that all day long, every day. So I, what, what uh, other services am I missing? What am I missing here? Well, they, uh, they, they're, this is a one-stop shop that handles all of our, you know, through our hiring process. Um, you know, to have multiple contracts, 
with different vendors to do similar things would be less efficient, we believe, uh, and just wouldn't be manageable. So this is, uh, we prefer to do it with just this one company that does everything for us. Yeah, well, I might prefer to work with somebody, but they may not be as good or they may not be as cheap as somebody else. Um, and, and you haven't articulated other than pre and post test screening exactly what services are provided. And I apologize for my ignorance on this. Uh, well, it, it varies in, in uh, tuberculosis test, uh, psychological analysis, uh, the, the drug testing, um, is there anything else you can think of it? Then we're back on. It, it's just a complete, comprehensive, fit for duty medical analysis, uh, and then a very comprehensive psychological examination of everyone as well. Um, and then uh, that's, that's going to be the medical and the psychological testing. Just one last, uh, and last then one. There's a, a written test. It's an in-person written test, a brain's assessment that assesses the, um, the what uh, reading level, a uh, grade they, they read on. on. Because we want uh, above a certain reading, a grade level. As well as decision-making uh, tools, sir. Thank you. Last question, and I'll, I'll be quiet, is, is that uh, who does the city of Winston-Salem use for this? Uh, FMRT. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Randy. All right. We have um, item 17, a resolution authorizing the grant of a right of entry agreement to North by Northwest Consulting Incorporated to access real property located at 400 West Haynes Mill Road. Chelsea with General Services will review this. Chelsea, you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. Um, as the county manager said, this is to authorize a grant of a right of entry for 100 West Haynes Mill Road. This is a Collidium North property. Um, and North by Northwest Consulting is requesting the right of entry to evaluate the land and do an appraisal on behalf of the NCDOT who is planning a road construction project that will um, affect a portion of our property at this location. Um, we brought this to you back in 2019 for an appraisal at that time. However, NCDOT put the project on hold, so we're bringing it back to you so that North by Northwest Consulting can update their appraisal. The property that will be affected is just under half an acre. And um, once we get the appraisal results, we expect NCDOT to provide an offer for the easements, which we would bring to you all at a later time. Um, and they expect to let the project in June of 2023. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions, comments? OK. All right, thank you, Chelsea. Agenda item 18 is a resolution authorizing execution and assignment of hangar lease at Smith Reynolds Airport from Truist Bank to Mount Arrow Properties uh, LLC. Turn it over to Gordon Watkins, our attorney. Uh, thank you. This is um, um, this is still in progress. We're still negotiating with Truist the actual assignment document, but this. Um, Resolution clearly states what the annual lease is now, $44,000, which will escalate to $102,000 um, if an optional renewal is exercised by the assignee in January 1st, 2026. Um, the only other thing I'll note about this is that the assignee, the, the probable assignee has changed its name. It was called Arrow X Properties, and now it's called Mount Arrow Properties. Comments or questions? I just want to verify one thing, Gordon, that after 2025, it goes back to the original rent. Or that's correct. Okay. And, and that's, that's pretty firm? That's in the third paragraph. Yeah, I mean, there's no loopholes or anything in there, is there? I hope. All parties are happy? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> reason I asked that. So all parties are not happy, okay. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Watts. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Very good. We're rounding it out. Item 19 is a resolution approving refunds by the tax collector, assessor collector in the amount of $1,332.49. It's from the North Carolina Vehicle Tax System, over $100. You've got two reports that are in the agenda, the contribution based benefit report and the human resources report. And Mr. Chairman, that is 
all we had. Oh, come on now. Get two or three more items. <laughs> I guess unless there's any questions that would need to be addressed in closed session, but I don't think I heard anything. So. All right. Any questions or comments? Final words before we move? Okay. Here. You can go. Talking about the closed session. We have a closed session, We right? do not. I do not believe well, we I thought we did. Session, so. Well, in that case, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Ted Kaplan says, so moved. Do I hear a second? Thanks. Second by Tanya McDaniel. Uh, Daniel. <laughs> All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? We're adjourned.